So we want to start off with our first talk. Uh, the speaker is Dr. Hamza Ghori from uh, Rawalpindi Institute of Cardiology, and he's going to talk about uh, posterior circulation. He's going to show us a case of posterior circulation stroke. Dr. Hamza, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. First of all, I would like to thank Pakistan Society of Interventional Cardiology for giving me this opportunity to be a part of this star-studded gathering, which is Pakistan Live 2022, and to represent my institute, that is Rawalpindi Institute of Cardiology, at this highly esteemed forum. So today, I'm going to present two cases of stroke intervention, and mostly it's basilar artery intervention that I'm going to touch. So I will start with First of my cases, which is the case of a 60-year-old lady who presented in our ER in a comatose state. Initial workup was done. Her blood sugar level was found to be 128 milligrams per deciliter. BP was 150 by 90. And after the initial workup, it was established that she was having posterior circulation stroke. So I'm just going to show you the next image, which is the CT angiogram of this patient. And you can see these are the two images that we have. And it's the distal basilar here which is occluded, and you can see in both of these coronal and sagittal views. So with this, after the initial assessment, and since we had seen the view of the patient, after taking the consent, was taken to the cath lab. And we had seen in the imaging that it was the right vertebral artery which was dominant. So it was decided to have a brachial approach. Six French sheath was taken, SIM2 catheter was used, and with this, the angiogram, which is a DSA imaging, which was done. And you can see this one here is a deep AP, also known as the town's view, and this is the lateral view. And I think if you can clearly appreciate here that the distal basilar is occluded. So with this, we moved further and decided to go for the intervention, which is mechanical aspiration thrombectomy that was decided in this case. So we changed the sheath with a 65 centimeter destination sheath, which was taken up, the ostium of the right vertebral was engaged, and a SOFIA plus, which is the aspiration catheter, was taken up over a Chikai wire, which is 0.014 wire. So I'm going to show you the next image here, how we did that. So you can see this image. It's a slight video that you can see. The wire is going up, and this is placed in the right PCA. This is the distal basilar, which is occluded. And SOFIA plus is taken up till this point, which is in the vertebral. But in this next image, you'll be able to see that SOFIA plus was taken distally, as distal as we could and negative aspiration with a lock syringe, whack lock syringe was applied and aspiration was done. Now what happened was, I think something which we all look for while we are doing these interventions, that we were able to get first pass recanalization with sticky three flow. And this is what it is. So you can see that, and I'm also going to show you the comparison here. So you can see that it was well revascularized. The patient did extremely well. In the initial few hours, the patient started moving all four limbs. In the next few days, she was walking, talking, and she has kept a good follow-up with us. Now, with this, I will move on to the next case. And all the cases are not that simple. This one was much more challenging and intriguing. So this is a 45-year-old gentleman who presented in the ER with quadriplegia, followed by loss of consciousness. Initial workup showed that his BSR was 256 milligrams per deciliter, BP 140 by 90. But interestingly, when we were doing the workup, we also found out that the patient was having inferior wall myocardial infarction. And most likely, this was the cause for him having a stroke. So we decided, after initial imaging, when posterior circulation stroke was established, that we'll shift the patient to the cath lab, we'll intervene for stroke first, and then the coronaries, if needed. So you can see I've brought this regular anatomy. And in this case, we took a right femoral sheet, six French axis, and the left vertebral was engaged with a SIM2 catheter. So this is the normal anatomy. You can see both the vertebral arteries joining and forming the basilar, and then both the right left PCAs, posterior cerebral arteries, are given. Here you can see the anatomy was slightly different. Vertebral arteries joining, and this is a tortuous basilar. And this, see, this is occluded distally. So with this, we proceeded. The whole inventory has been shown here, but I'm going to go through the case, and we'll explain it down the line. So the patient underwent adapt technique for aspiration thrombectomy, as I've explained earlier. And this is the wire, this time being taken. It's the same Chikai wire, 0.014 wire, taken into the left PCA. And you can see the Sophia, which was taken up, negative pressure aspiration, and Sophia Plus was taken out. And we did the first run. 
to no avail. We did another run, but still we were unable to achieve recanalization. So at this point, we thought of resorting to some other technique, and that was obviously Solumbra, which is the deployment of uh, scent retriever, and this tent mostly is Solitaire X4 into 40 mm that we are using, and this was unsheathed in the left PCA by taking the Raybar microcatheter down. It was taken out. Sophia was taken up, and I think you can clearly appreciate here, and the whole apparatus was taken out. But unfortunately, after two runs of this, we were still unable to recanalize. And at this juncture, we had to think out of the box. So what did we do? We then moved to the next technique after these failed attempt, and this technique is known as the simultaneous stent deployment or a Y stent deployment. So you can see here, what we did was, we took the Sophia Plus out, we took two microcatheters, which were on a wire, took them up into the distal basilar artery here. So I'm going to make it easier for you in this still. Yes, so we took it up, parked both the microcatheters in both of these PCAs, and then they were unsheathed and since the stents were deployed after unsheathing the microcatheters. So this gave us a Y configuration. You can see these horizontal stumps. These are in the PCAs, and you have the vertical stump, which is extending. The both, both these stents have a vertical stump, which is extending into the distal basilla, and then the Sophia Plus was taken up, ideally it was supposed to be taken up. And luckily we were able to take it up, almost up to the distal basilla, engulfing this vertical limb of the two stents. And after this, the whole assembly was pulled down. So this next slide, I think, is going to, again, this is not moving forward. So I think so slides are not moving ahead. So what we did was we brought it down, and with this, we were able to achieve Tiki 3 flow and recanalization was done, if somebody, yes, I think now we have it running. So again, when you take it out, so I'll hurry on to this, this is the kind of formation you want. You have these two distal prongs hanging within the Sophia Plus, and negative suction is applied, and with this technique, you have the mass maximum aspiration, maximum clot capture, and this is exactly what we did. So I'm just gonna show you the results, and this is pre-intervention, and that's post-intervention. And if I show you the stills, these are the still images that you can see, and you can clearly see the outcome. So the patient also underwent coronary PCI, POBA was done to the RCA with good results. The patient was then shifted out, and patient showed brilliant recovery. He was talking, walking, responding to commands in the next few hours. And I'm just gonna show you this video. Of obviously, this has been taken by the consent of the patient and by taking full permission, and he was walking, obeying commands. I apologize, I think this was somehow not coming straight in our initial run. So the patient was pretty much obeying all the commands and he did very well. Uh, with this, I also would like to mention here that in our setup, we have almost done 26 basilar stroke interventions and we have had a success rate of almost 70%. I think we'll have the audit coming uh, very soon in the subsequent lectures. So with this, I would like to thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hamza. So next I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Omar Goktekan from Turkey, and he's going to talk about the need for stroke cardiologists and the training required for that. Thank you, Ranj Dirasim. I'd like to thank uh, the Pakistan Society of Interventional Cardiology for having me for this uh, really uh, important and big meeting. And we came here uh, as a team from Turkey. Uh, we are eight uh, high-level international cardiologist uh, in this meeting, and we, we are extremely honored and happy to be here. So, um, uh, we have a huge problem regarding treatment of stroke intervention. In the U.S., for example, they have uh, more than 800,000 stroke and only 200 uh, 75,000 of, of them has a uh, large vessel occlusion, means can be treated by endovascular treatment, uh, one third of it, but only 3% of the patients uh, are treated. So it's very low. You know, I US is a very developed country. Why is it's, it's, it's that much low? Because there is no enough manpower to treat those patients. 
Uh, as you know, in, in the beginning, interventional neuroradiologists take care of these patients, but they are limited, they have limited number. They can't treat everyone. They can't work 24 hours in many centers because of the, the uh, number in that uh, institute. So some other, uh, some other uh, professional group can help to treat these patients. And I think one of the important group uh, are us. As interventional cardiologists, we can treat them. We have examples, we have good, very good examples. And result of interventional cardiologists has very similar to interventional radiologists. That's why we are interesting, that's why Asim and others are interested in this field. And it should be in increased um, very fast. So we have role, in to, as, as cardiologists, we, we have role in stroke anyway, because we treat type rotation, we treat type lipidemia, we treat atrial fibrillation and PFO as a reason of stroke. And also, we have a role for carotid stenting. This is very important uh, point. Mm -hmm. we, have to treat, we have to treat carotid intervention before we start stroke intervention anyway. So I think the stroke intervention only for carotid interventionalists. If someone doesn't do carotid intervention, they cannot start stroke intervention right away. It's not possible. They have to start first carotid intervention. At least 25 cases should be done. Uh, and then uh, later on, they can start stroke intervention. We have, I think, enough catheter uh, and viricicles. We have very similar device in coronaries. Uh, similar macrocatheter, similar wires even. Um, so we have good mindset for that. We can work 24 hours. We can go to hospital at the middle, uh, middle of night. Very few neurologists go to hospital mi midnight. But we go. we go. We go every day. And also, in many, uh, which is good advantage for us, we have many uh, good relation with the stroke neurologists in our hospitals. We have already have a strong link uh, with because you know we have common patients. Uh, they send their patients to us. We send the, our patients to them. So we have a good relation with stroke neurologists. I think this is a very good base to start stroke intervention. As I told you, we have to start with the correct intervention in many countries. For example, uh, in my country too, now we are leading coronary artery standing. We do much more than uh, radio, interventional radiologists uh, for coronary artery, uh, artery standing. Uh, so uh, in that case, if we do you know, routine correct artery standing, why don't we do acoustic intervention? Of course, if we have enough, uh, in, enough training and knowledge, that's the question. Anatomy is very important, but it's not that big deal. We are cardiologists, you know, we are, um, you know, have enough, uh, I think, uh, IQ to learn uh, neuroanatomy. I think, I think easily we can learn it, but we have to uh, know everything about it. So, for current uh, for a good stroke in, in, in intervention, one of the the most important part to deal with the, the um, arcus, uh, arcus aorta. It's important. We have type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 3 is difficult to engage and uh, access, of course, and especially in the elderly patients, there are lots of uh, ateroma. Uh, easily we can have another embol uh, embolization when we try to access the uh, uh, carotid artery. So that's why we have to, we have to do this um, um, Skill, we, we have to have the skill before starting stroke intervention. We have lots of catheter to reach uh, the, uh, to access the carotid artery and also for vertebral arteries. So those some uh, catheters for complex uh, arcus aorta. If it is type 1, we can deal with the right Jatkins or vertebral artery. Or if it is type 3, most probably we need Simon uh, catheters, but we have to be careful when we uh, reforming them in the aorta. So, for example, this one is uh, type 1 and type 2 and type 3. 
and we might have a big problem if they have type 3, especially in uh, very elderly patients like this, for example. If we can't ask, uh, engage in 20 minutes, so we, we had better stop it because we might have a uh, thrombotic event, embolic event. So essential components of endovascular therapy, patient selection. This is extremely important, of course. But I think this part is mostly should be done in our stroke neurologist. In our um, experience, in our uh, hospital, uh, stroke neurologists uh, choose the patients and they ask to operate the patient from us. So I think patient selection, of course, can be done by cardiologists if they have enough training, if they if they have you know, uh, a proper fellowship program, like one year or two years, of course, uh, they also can select the patients. Appropriate team members is very important. We should have good radiologist, good stroke physician, good neurologist, and interventionalist in that team. We don't need to have uh, uh, mostly anesthesiologists because um, we, we don't do general anesthesia. Studies show that if we do, if we, if we do general anesthesia, results are uh, worse than local sedation. We have to identify the site of occlusion. This is very important. It's not like coronary. Sometimes you, use, you look for uh, very carefully. Sometimes easily you, you, you miss, uh, uh, you can, uh, 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 you may not see it. Stable access is important, as I told you. Pharmacological selection is important because we are we are we, we like heparin in our procedure, but this could be very dangerous in stroke intervention. We have to be very careful about this, and equipment selection is important. We have to uh, s select accordingly. Respect the artery. I think this is very important. Arteries are different than coronaries. We should know when we stop, right? So the aim is not to open the artery here. The aim is to help. The, the patients. We can, you can have the open artery at the end, but you, you have nothing. And post-op care is important, and again, stock um, neurologists um, will do it. Intracerebral hemorrhage is one of the most important issue, and is, is the wolf nipping at our heels. Patients easily uh, bleed. We, have, we can have easily big intracerebral hematoma. We have to be very careful. You know, if we have uh, a score is high, we, ha we have more uh, uh, hemorrhage. If the, if the duration is, uh, of ischemia is longer, we have, again, more uh, hemorrhage. Size of infection is important. Size of penumbra is important. Blood pressure, blood glucose, patient age, pharmacological therapy, collateral dementia device, and choice of anesthesia is also important regarding hemorrhage. So we should afraid uh, hemorrhagia. Um, identifying locations of occlusion uh, 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 is important. We have to have excellent angiography technique for that. We have to have multiple uh, angles. Uh, Step AP, true lateral, large field of view, imaging entire school and scalp. Delayed filming is important. Sometimes we see uh, you know, the, the occlusion at the very end of the uh, Floral, cortical blush, vessel cut off, early venous shunting, retrograde feeling, clinical correlation. For example, if you look at this patient, uh, I don't know as cardiologists, uh, any of you can tell me where is the uh, stump, where is the occlusion. You know, this is AP and lateral, but it's not that clear. There is occlusion here. If you look, that lateral uh, side, there is you know, no vessel here. It must be vessel. There must be vessel there. So there is occlusion. But where is the occlusion? If we go a little oblique, we can see better, but there is occlusion here. So this is one of the important parts for us as a cardiologist, but as for everyone uh, you know, who does this job, uh, also for neuroradiologists, they have, we have to look very carefully, and we have to see all um, vessels. Stable access is very important. Uh, you know, 
we can use uh, normally now we use routinely uh, eight French balloon guiding catheter. Uh, studies shows that it's more beneficial, you know, to uh, using uh, eight French. Uh, I mean balloon guided uh, uh, balloon guide. Rarely sheath income coated uh, for extra and proximal tortuosity. We have to sometimes we may have to go more uh, distal. Distal access catheter, instal proximal distal tortuosity is important. And these days, mostly we use, as uh, Hamza showed, we use uh, distal access catheter like Sofia. They help us a lot to go more distal and to do uh, aspiration. Pharmacologic, pharmacologic, uh, pharmacology is very important, as I have told. Uh, heparin, we have to be very gentle regarding heparin. We give heparin why? To prevent catheter. Um, uh, clotting, okay? So to do that also we should give uh, continuous fluid uh, through, through our catheters. We may need thrombolytics and also we may need GP, uh, 2B and 3A inhibitors. So most, most of the time we use six to eight French sheath and uh, it, uh, we in routinely we use now Neuroguide catheter like so Sofia. Balloon guiding is very helpful. We, may, we have Mercy, uh, Cello, and others. And you, uh, um, regarding, regarding wires, um, in some centers, I don't know how you, how you do, ask him here, but sometimes not easy to reach, um, you know, neuro, uh, um, neurological wires, not easy. Yeah. In that case, uh, we, we, we can use some coronary wires, some coronary hydrophilic, soft hydrophilic wires like builder or whisper uh, uh, low sport catheter. But if you have neurological one, of course, those could be better. And macro catheter is important. They are a little uh, bigger than our macro catheter in terms of lumen. They, uh, we have maximum trevo, rapid transit, etc. This is balloon guiding. After place the guiding, we inflate the ball like MoMA, very similar to MoMA. So you know we used to use MoMA, uh, the uh, the MoMA catheter. So it is uh, exactly the same. I think um, Asim will talk about more stent river devices. Uh, they are like stent stent like device to uh, to the embryotomy. We have solitaire trivo and other many devices now in the market. And there is a penumbra aspiration system. We can do aspiration by manually, but also we can do uh, aspiration with penumbra device. Um, and we have also other techniques, like Hamza mentioned, we have sonimbra adapt or push and pull technique. Respect to artery is extremely important because there is no external elastic lamina. There is a minimal adventitia. They are very, the, uh, the brain artery is very gentle, easily we can perforate them. Tin tunica media and muscularis. And, uh, and also we have uh, microscopic perforators. We don't see them. They are very small, but if we, if we occlude them, we might have a severe result. So we, 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 we had better use uh, no touch technique, never oversize. It's not like coronary. It's better to be undersized. We have to use uh, soft equipment. I have maybe one another minute, or we finished it. Maybe one minute more, if you give up. If you. Yeah. So when we stop. You know, after one hour, if we don't, if we don't, if we don't do anything, we had better stop. After two hours, we should definitely stop. If we try more than two devices, we had better stop. If the patient go, if the patient has clinical deterioration, we should stop. We have, if we have full collaterals, we should stop. You know, if we have wide perforation, reperfusion injury, distal embolization, uh, you know, uh, if we have big initial infarct size, we should stop earlier. We, we might have um, uh, some complication like spasm, dissection, perforation, hemorrhagia, and failure. And also, we, we, we might have reperfusion into cerebral hemorrhagia and cerebral edema after, after the procedure. If we have perforation, we have to tamponate by balloon. 
you know, we shouldn't over, oversize balloon again. We have to reverse all anticoagulations. We have to have lower blood pressure, uh, less than 100, and leave the vessel occluded because we have done enough. It's better to leave it occluded. And we should call the neurosurgeons, but they don't do, uh, they don't have that much to do. post op care, mostly uh, in our institute, is uh, done by uh, neurologists. They take care of the patients. And uh, to start stroke intervention, we need to have very good stroke ne neurologists, and we have to have very good relation with them. Without neurology help, we do nothing. Because they have the patients. They send their patients to us. So this is the summary. We, ha we have to select patients appro appropriately. Small nettitic core, for example, large ischemic penipra. We shouldn't overdose pharmacological uh, agents. We should know cerebral anatomy, and we should see where is the occlusion and if there is any tandem lesions. Use the softest and latest aggressive device for the uh, job. Don't put the patient's GA. Uh, it's better to do it local uh, sedation, under local sedation. And we should know when it's stop. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Omar. So I think the most burning question is, in Pakistan, do we really need cardiologists to come into this field and uh, learn and start stroke intervention. Is it really doable in a cardiac center? So I think let's hear what our panel of experts has to say. So can I start with General Kiani, please? So what are your views on this? And then Dr. Nadeem Rizvi and others can join in as well. Thank you. Uh, I think most of us, uh, they are very uh, trained cardiologists. And as far as the skills are concerned, are you very familiar with the disposable devices, all kind of devices. And you know, I think, when to stop and where to stop. Uh, the thing is, the kind of experience a cardiologist have, I don't think a neurologist, uh, his experience with so, uh, the, such kind of a volume. And uh, it usually takes, the learning curve is very small as far as the cardiologists are concerned. I think we had the similar kind of uh, apprehension when we started this program in the Alpine Institute of Cardiology. And uh, there was, uh, uh, a lot of anxiety and then a lot of opposition when we started this program because we, I think it's not a, initially we thought it's not a cardiologist's domain, but someone has to do it and the people were suffering. And since we have so much of coronary load on our side, it's very difficult to handle that load, but I think you have to, uh, someone has to do it. Uh, we were waiting for the neurologist, interventionist, uh, interventional neurologist to come in and they play their part. But I think this is really very important and we've done wonders. Uh, you have a proper kind of a training and how to select the patient, how to triage the patient, how to manage the patient. Then you have a multidisciplinary team on your side. That's a very important thing. You should have a neurologist on your side, you should have a neurosurgeon on your side. Then intensive care, I think intensive care after the procedure when it's needed, especially after the procedure, you have a hemorrhage or cerebral edema and you need intensive care of neurology. Then you should have a support of your colleagues. That's a very important thing. And we were very lucky that we had a very forthcoming team in Rawal Pindi available. We have a people uh, from DHQ, neurosurgeons, anesthetists, then physiotherapists, everyone was available. And then we have a very young guy who was as a budding neurologist. He was with us in the team, right at the site in the RIC. And they've done wonders. Can you imagine? I think they'll later in the presentation, they will give the data of how many cases, more than 300 cases or 400 cases they have done over there. Anyone in the uh, in in the neurological center perhaps have done that number of cases or not? I anyone has crossed a figure of 50 at all? Or not? I think this is how to do it. This is how to. I think the cardiac uh, cardiology institutes in Pakistan, be it our RIC, then it's AFIC or PIC or FIC or Multan Cardi Institute, NICVD. Uh, I'll leave the Zirabad Institute of Cardiology because they don't have a required multidisciplinary support in that area available. But we, all other institutes, they can start this program with it. We have got the required uh, uh, disposable available with you, the requirement, I think, desired kind of a training. And then you have got a, I think it's a wonderful, a very forthcoming, uh, dynamic, uh, awesome, uh, who has, uh, I think, uh, he has offered himself and then volunteered to train all the people who are interested in doing the uh, intervention and acute stroke program. And when I was entering this hall, then I met a few of the young 
uh, interventional cardiologist from NICUD, and they, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to know that they had done more than 40 thrombectomies in NICUD. And I think kudos to NICVD and their leadership over there. And this is how I think you have to, you have to uh, engage, uh, involve yourself. And this is really very important. We know that uh, there's a coronary workload, but then the certain dedicated interventional cardiologists, they can, I can take this uh, uh, task of uh, acute stroke intervention and start this program. So it's not difficult at all, I think. If you've got a will to do it, you can do it. And it's doable. It's not, you can say it's not do, it's doable. Uh, once our neurologist colleagues and interventionists, they come up to the mark and start doing this kind of procedure and take this load off, yes, then we can, I can say, okay, thank you, my goodbye, take all the acute stone uh, intervention cases over there, and then you can, I think, concentrate on the cardiology, but focus on cardiology. But this is what it is, I think, is doable, and the, the, the cardiologists, I think, they uh, normally feel very comfortable doing these procedures because very familiar with the tactile feelings of the catheters, of the wires, of the balloon, that the stents, and if everything goes wrong, complication, whether it's a dissection or perforation or no flow, they know how to manage it. They, ma they manage the coronaries. I think very difficult to manage the coronaries, but they can manage this cerebral circulation. Sir, thank you very much. Before I request Dr. Nadeem Rizvi to respond, may I ask Dr. Omar, um, so Turkey is very well advanced in the field of medicine, and I'm sure interventional neurology and interventional radiology would also be quite adequately established. So as an interventional cardiologist, you do so much stuff from interventional cardiology and structural heart disease and CTOs. What made you come to uh, stroke intervention? You're doing stroke interventions in Turkey, so how did you land up here, and what's the state of cardiologists getting involved with stroke in uh, Turkey? Yeah. You know, s uh, th the first of all, we do extensive cortical intervention. So I think in uh, our uh, mindset was re ready to go up, first of all. So we do, uh, for years, we do cortical intervention. Um, the this, this secondly, you know, after, uh, we, we, are, we are not in the, the, uh, the first cardiologist who does this. I mean, for many years, some colleague from U.S., you know, some colleague from uh, North Af uh, South Africa, uh, you know, f f for many, is th uh, they do stroke intervention. So after seeing them, you know, and after seeing that the procedure itself is not that difficult for us because, you know, we, we are very familiar to use macrocatheter. You know, uh, we know all kind of macrocatheter. We started CTO business with the echelon 10, for example, which was belongs to neurology in that ca in that time we done there some 20 years ago for example we 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 doesn't have we, so we didn't have enough uh, macrocatheter we used their macrocatheter for many years um, you know and then uh, after I see that we can do it and uh, there is unmet need so you know I I I, uh, I said I we 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 had better go involved so even in Turkey you think there's an unmet need for stroke interventionists. Sorry? So in Turkey also you think there's an unmet need because of... Oh, everywhere. You decided yes, to no need to say it in, in so, everywhere. So, so just to add on to that, um, uh, not only Turkey, but cardiologists are involved in stroke intervention in USA, in Germany, Netherlands, Portugal, Slovakia, uh, in South Africa. So there are many countries where international cardiologists are actually part of the stroke intervention team and they do the interventional aspect. Uh, so, Dr. Nadeem Rizvi, your views on this? Your yeah. current president, PSIC, so your views do matter because a lot of people have this uh, fear in their mind that the society needs to be behind them before cardiology jumps into this. No, I think, I mean, my views are well known, you know, and they're pretty radical. They've always been because Pakistan has a, is a specific uh, environment. And... Uh, it, you cannot really superimpose a Western or a US or a European model straight away here. People die here, it's a matter of, uh, uh, you need to have two, three things which are essentially red lines. You need to keep the patient safety first. MBBS gives you a, 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 the license to treat patients. Now. It, the further super specializations have to be modeled according to your local environment. So just to give you a small, and everyone knows this, when we started the NICVD primary program, 
the first angioplasty, uh, the first case that was done in Larkana of, of catheterization was an acute anterior MI. There was, there was no angiogram before that. There were no cardi uh, surgical uh, backup within 300 miles. And even if you go in the desert in Mithi, there are hardly any, any blood labs, but people get MIs. How are they going to travel four hours and things? So we set up a, there are, so in a whole of Sindh, NICVD does primary angioplasties without backups with, with, with safety, which is equivalent anywhere in the world. Because if you are having an MI, it's, a, it's an acute emergency. If you break your bone, you, you, you're not going to wait for an orthopedic surgeon or if you have a bullet wound and you bleed to death, someone has to. So I think it's an unmet need which you and uh, with Dr. Azar Kiani, I think the thing was that essentially if you, ask, if you allow me to be a bit blunt, he bulldozed it and uh, despite all the resistance that you had. So it's a matter of domains that we have, it's a matter of egos, and I think those have to be transcended for our local environment. So I am 100% behind anyone who uh, gives a 24-hour service, which is according to certain standards. So standard care has to be maintained. It doesn't matter whether it's a neurologist or a radiologist or a cardiologist, the standards are set up by international data, safety regulations, you fulfill that, whether you are a neurologist or a radiologist or a cardiologist, that doesn't matter. As long as you fulfill the basic criteria and 24-hour services, there are only available in cardiac institutes in Pakistan, fortunately or unfortunately. There are no 24-hour neurology institutes. There are no 24-hour radiology institutes. There are only 24-hour primary services given by tertiary cardiac centers, which are all over the country. So how can you not give you, if, if a person ends up with stroke, uh, if a patient ends up with an MI, he has a renal dysfunction. So uh, would the ne a nephrologist say that I'm not going to go and see the patient in a, because it's in a cardiac institute? No, he comes there. You have dialysis, you have uh, infective control people. So similarly, so I think the egos have to be set aside and the society will 100% back up this stroke and, uh, program and I think it should be done in every cardiac institute in Pakistan. Thank you, sir. So any question from the audience? It's a good opportunity to ask any question regarding the role of cardiologist. This is the topic. So anybody interested? I think in the radiologist the is here. Let's get his view yeah, because I'm sure he must, him. he's doing acute intervention in a cardiac center. So he, his colleagues must be on his back. Uh, let's see what Dr. So Irfan Lutfi. Let me introduce Dr. Irfan Lutfi. He's leading the program of stroke yeah. intervention in NICVD. He's an interventional radiologist. So let's see what his views are. Uh, I think it's a time to need to start uh, mechanical thrombectomy in every center because uh, when I start doing uh, neuro intervention, there's only one neuro intervention who's doing neuro intervention in Karachi and he's not trying to teach any other person. So I uh, thought at that time, why only one person? Because a lot of disease of neuro and only one person is treating and and he knows how to treat uh, ischemic stroke. So I start doing uh, peripheral and neuro intervention and then a lot of people of my society, other societies uh, start to, uh, trying to stop me for doing this. Then I go outside, you know, better than <laughs> any other person. So when I come, came here in, uh, uh, back to Karachi and I start these services in Ziauddin Hospital, but uh, unfortunately, this uh, mechanical thrombectomy or ischemic stroke services is not the uh, domain of the pr uh, private sectors. It's only doable in the public sector. If, this is my personal opinion, because if patient is landed at 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. Uh, and you ask to uh, submit the five, 5 lakh or 10 lakh rupees, so how can it be possible? Anybody can uh, draw the money of five or 10 lakh rupees from his pocket. So it's not doable in private sectors, in my point of view. I tried two years in private sector, then I joined NICVD, and I'm very happy to join NICVD, and there's a lot of uh, burden of ischemic stroke in our population. Because I think you've raised a very important point here. 
and since Dr. Bashir and he is from a private sector, yes, uh, yeah. and they have started doing stroke intervention as well, so I would like the private sector <laughs> to respond to that. How are they managing the stroke <laughs> interventions? <laughs> okay, so I think uh, first of all, what uh, Nadeem or uh, Dr. Kiani has said, I fully agree and echo that. I think uh, uh, if we had enough um, an interventional neurologist or interventional radiologist, then uh, it's probably okay they could have done it, but uh, cardiologists, since uh, obviously they are doing uh, coronary interventions, they can do it. But just one word of caution, I think you will probably agree to that, that we need to have some basic training. It's uh, not exactly the same as coronaries. So you need to understand the basic um, things about brain before you start doing it. And you are doing a marvelous job, no doubt about that, uh, about basics of that. And I think there is a little bit more into it. You, somebody need to go and you are offering now people to come to you and see while doing it. Just theoretical knowledge may not be enough. So it's very important that those who are interested they need to really read about it, learn basics, and maybe see and do some cases and then start doing it. So that's very important. Now, regarding private sector, you asked, I think he's, uh, Irfan is absolutely right. It's not easy. It's very costly and very difficult. Um, luckily, again, although Tabba Heart Institute is private, but uh, it's a not-for-profit, and uh, we have the luxury of a uh, lot of uh, funding available. Uh, just like we did for acute myocardial infarction, although it's a private hospital, I think we are the only private hospital. Anyone coming with acute MI, they will be taken to the cath lab for a primary PCI. It doesn't matter even if they don't have penny. And that is like we started about four or five years ago. Before that, just like other private hospital, we used to ask for money and all that kind of stuff. But I push for it that this is the place where we really make a difference and we have to do something and I asked Taba family to give us funds that we should be able to do the primary PCI and those, those patients later who can pay, they can pay, otherwise they will be given from uh, that welfare fund. Similarly, we have um, started the uh, program and um, we also have been discussing with family and they had supported us just like they supported us to start the TAVI program, they have supported us to start the stroke program also. So now again, I think I personally feel and uh, that I think the difference we make by doing stroke intervention is much more than with acute MI even because it's a disability which is going to be for lifelong for the patient and, uh, and the family. And if we, uh, Abdul Salam showed some cases how you could, if this was, would not have been done, uh, those patients would have been like disabled for life. So it really makes a huge difference and I think uh, there's no doubt about that, that all the um, uh, government institutes definitely should try to work on it. And private institutes also should start wherever they can um, help those patients. If not, anyone coming to them, they can refer to the places where it's being done. And it's important, even if you can't start the service, you need to learn the skill because you have complications like stroke and during your coronary interventions. You should be able to retrieve your patient yourself. Uh, so moving on with the program, I want to invite Dr. Kamran from NICVD and he's going to share his uh, cases of uh, anterior circulation stroke and uh, maybe some NIC, NICVD data as well. While you are waiting, I'd just like to ask Dr. Uh, uh, Irfan Lutfi, the Society of Interventional Radiologists, what's their point of view? Are they, why don't they meet with the Society of Interventional Cardiology and Neurology and get a training program of sort of which is agreeable to everyone? Don't you have meetings like this? No, we have a, a meeting like this, but uh, uh, they try to come, uh, any neuro intervention try to come with the proper channel, proper training and all that. And all the time uh, when I uh, visited uh, RIC for many time, they, I, 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 I faced a lot of resistance from the, my society. So why you are going to train the cardiologists for neuro or stroke? So 
I can't. <laughs> so is that the so same, Omar Gotkin, uh, is that the same in Turkey? Is there uh, some resistance between neurologists, radiologists and cardiologists or? Yeah, we have, uh, yes, we have uh, resistance between cardiologists and intervention neuroradiologists. But, you know, a strong one. But we have very good relations with intervention neurologists. So in Turkey, intervention neurologists and intervention cardiologists work together. This is, I think, our, our success is here. Yeah, I think in, in, like, uh, in Pakistan, although we don't have, there's probably only one interventional neurologist, but even general ne neurologists have a lot of resistance. And um, we try to talk to actually uh, the neuro societies and actually the neuro society president was my friend and I tried to convince him that we need to work together and he was so against it that, that he flatly refused. He said there's no way that a cardiologist should be doing this, we'll do whatever we do and that kind of stuff. So it's uh, unfortunate but that's how it is. So I think we should start a fellowship the, yeah. in, in, in intervention, Are the other, in stroke uh, intervention. interventional radiologists doing uh, stroke intervention in Pakistan or in Karachi, do you know it from? I think uh, stroke intervention. Sorry. Any intervention radiologist in Karachi or any wells? A well trained of uh, ischemic stroke intervention, otherwise there's no one. So means the RIC, um, the NICVD and Tabba. Um, I think the three institutes are doing stroke intervention yes. most commonly. Yes. And, uh, I think, I, I you think know. Uh, we have to sit together and start uh, uh, and train many people because the burden in the society is too much burden in the society. When I joined in ICVT, then I realized there's a lot of uh, patient with ischemic stroke more than any Western countries and any European countries because ICAD is very common in our countries like India and Pakistan, so there's more strokes. Even 30 years of age, 40 years of age, uh, you have a stroke every other day. I think we should have a, we should have a terminology like primary stroke intervention, like primary PCI. Yeah. Yes, but I think, uh, sorry, I think, to be honest with you, this job for after for many years will belong to intervention neurologists because they have the patients and if yeah. they know how to do it, they will do it for sure. And how we convince them, you know, mm -hmm. Bashir, we saying that we are here to help you, to teach you how to access the groin, you know, how to go to uh, carotid. So we, we, we try to teach them carotid stenting and other things, so we work together. And I believe that some 30 years later, they will do it, because it's a huge, you know, work to do. To me, much more important than uh, primary PCI. Yeah, yeah. We are talking about you know, something very different. Very different. So they will do it. Maybe 20 years later, 30 years later, we will not involve anymore because neurology is big, uh, yeah. you know, a specialty, yes? So they have yeah. tons, tons of uh, specialists everywhere. That's what I actually offered them. I met the president and secretary of the Neuro Society and I told them that we will help you to train you and tell you get trained, then you, you can do it. But still, there's only one interventional neurologist and he's like dead against that anyone else should be doing it and there's like very difficult, but I guess then over it, takes it doesn't really matter because we are doing it anyway. If they do this, it takes maybe 50 years yeah. to be routine <laughs> <Exactly>. practice. <laughs> Yes, please. Mike. So uh, I'm glad that military has started it. So they've got their neurologist doing it. They've got uh, a theory where the radiology has also started doing it. And I'm not sure about neurosurgery. Somebody told me that they've got a cath lab in CMH and somebody from them has also started doing it. So although it would have been better if they combined their efforts, but still they're doing it separately, but at least they've started. So that's the good thing. But, uh, just to add to your, these comments, in UK that, you know, neuro, the radio, uh, radiologists uh, get trained in the neuro uh, stroke management. And at most of the hospitals, Acute stroke patients are similarly taken to for CT scan and MRI, and whatever is required is offered by the radiologist. 
So I think that is a domain of the radiologist, uh, international radiologist in uh, developed countries, but obviously there's always an overlap in developing countries. So let's see, you know, whoever starts doing it, as long as it's being done by a trained person, as Dr. Bashir Bashi Hanif has said, that doing a procedure is not enough, knowing about it, how to do it, and what are the consequences, and where it's going to lead to it, and what would be the complication, that should be known. Because as a cardiologist, we are aware of all the complications of the coronary interventions, so it's not difficult to manage the coronary interventions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I, can first I just of all, I would like to thank you, the Honorable Panel and the Pakistan Society of Cardiology Intervention for giving me the opportunity of representing the NICBD, uh, my institute for uh, the platform of the stroke intervention, which is right now the growing and flourishing from the stroke intervention standpoint. So my topic of presentation is the MCA intervention. So I would like, first of all, uh, just very brief, quick uh, view about that. Uh, uh, majority of the stroke has already been said by the uh, Dr. Umar that they are the ischemic one. And uh, out of this ischemic stroke, almost uh, majority of them are because of the large vessel occlusion. So he has already explained well to us. So just uh, briefly, what is mechanical thrombectomy? So that's the removal of clot. And uh, if it is done with the, stent, uh, with the help of the stent retriever, that is called as Salumbra technique. And if it is done without the use of the stent retriever, that is called as KDAP a direct aspiration first pass technique. So that's my case. So I'm going to present this lady who was a 70 year old lady with a history of hypertension, function class two to three, and has uh, had uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. And she presented with left-sided hemiparesis. Her initial clinical, clinical evaluation in the ER showed left-sided hemiparesis, left facial drooping, right gaze preference, dysarthria, and her NIH score uh, was calculated to be 16. So initial ER assessment was completed within 20 minutes, uh, and this is our initial uh, uh, form. And uh, this video was made on the presentation with the permission of the uh, caretakers and the authorities. So here we can appreciate that she was unable to move her uh, left leg and uh, left arm, and the, there was uh, gaze preference on the right side and left-sided facial drooping. So that was the initial presentation. So within the next 15 minutes, she was taken for the non-contrast CT and that ruled out the bleed and her aspect score was turned out to be 10. So within the next 15 minutes, her contrast CT was performed. And here we noted that there was occlusion, there was a cutoff in the right MCA, middle cerebral artery. So we can appreciate in both views. So we reviewed the selection criteria for thrombectomy for her, and uh, these were the points as far as the age, pre-stroke, MRS, NIH, so she was completely fulfilling the criteria, and then in the next 10 minutes, she was shifted to the cat lab because it was very close to the uh, city injury unit. So this is her diagnostic cerebral angiogram. So here we can see the cutoff in the M1 segment of the right middle cerebral artery. So for the mechanical thrombectomy, we build up the tower, and uh, that is consisting of the, first of all, the guiding catheter, then the uh, dyslexis catheter or the intermediate catheter, microcatheter, and the wire. And here we can appreciate. And finally, we perform the sulumbra technique. So we extracted the thrombus with the help of the stent retriever. Post thrombectomy results are this. So this is the oblique view. So we can see the occluded artery has opened now, and that other one is a lateral view. So here we can appreciate what was the pre and what was the post for her. So that was a clot which we retrieved with the cellula. And this was the video was ma uh, made immediately post thrombectomy, like within half an hour or so. So here we can appreciate that she was able to move her left arm, and sh her gaze was actually <laughs> normalizing immediately. And that was the next day from back to me here, we can appreciate. I think there was sound was also there. So she was nicely vocalizing, mobilizing, understanding the command, and moving her both her upper and the lower limbs. And that was the next day CT that we performed, and it turned out to be very 
satisfactory. Then we, uh, then this another case, just a quick view of that. So on the left hand side, we can see the baseline presentation in the ER, and that was presented with global aphasia, and he was unable to move his um, left arm and left leg. And uh, that was the presentation in the cerebral NGO. So left NCA was occluded. And then we performed the thrombectomy again with the help of the Salumbra technique. And this is the post that we can appreciate over here. And a few more stroke intervention clips that we performed at NICVD. So again, MCA, which is opened nicely. And the one, again, MCA, again, MCA. And the last one that we did out of like over 40 cases, the posterior circulation one. I would like to give an overview how we selected the criteria. As Dr. Uh, Professor Kiani has already, I mean, told us where there was there is a will, there is a way. So actually, we were actually followed that pathway. So initially, I mean, like uh, in total, we entertained and evaluated almost 800 patients in NICVD ER, and 200 were uh, straight away referred to the Jinnah Post Medical Center because they were not fitting based on their history and the initial, initial evaluation for the thrombectomy criteria that I've already explained. And out of these, only 500 patients were left and selected for the screening through plain CT scan. Out of those, 345 patients showed ischemic stroke and 155 hemorrhagic stroke. Out of those 345 patients, 195 patients were excluded based on their aspect score, and then we were left only with 149 patients. And subsequently, they underwent the contrast CT scan. Out of those 105 patients turned out to have small vessel occlusion, for that we just need the medical treatment and follow-up, and they were transferred to the JPMC again. And then finally we were left with 44 patients who have shown the large vessel occlusion. Out of those five patients were excluded because they were, uh, because of the consent issue or the other exclusion criteria. And finally we were left with 40 patients in which we performed and they qualified for the mechanical thrombectomy. And TPA was used only in nine patients according to the guidelines. So as far as our stroke intervention program is concerned, so I would first uh, like to mention about uh, Professor Nadim Kamar, who and the main credit goes to him, who is actually thought about it, and with the view that cardiac inter interventionists can perform because of the you know, long uh, interventional skills of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, from the cardiology aspect, and his vision was to provide the 24-7 stroke intervention program and that should be free of course all over the area. And then I would must pay thanks for the continuous motivation from Dr. Asim and uh, <laughs> Professor Tahir Kareem who actually helped us uh, in setting up the uh, program uh, from the ER to the cat lab. So he facilitated that and finally Professor Irfan Lutfi who actually headed our stroke intervention program and is sitting with us. And lastly, but not leastly, for their continuous technical and the moral support, uh, our fellows from the USA, Dr. Sayyid Fazal Zadi, who is a stroke internationalist, and Dr. Hisham Salahuddin, so who continuously, I mean, like, involve in our technical support. And this is our right now team of the NICVD. Myself, Professor Irfan Lutfi, Salman is a neurologist, Jangir Ali Shah is sitting in front of me, Dr. Khaled, Dr. Rajesh. Thank you. So next we're going to talk about uh, what are the techniques for doing this mechanical thrombectomy. So I totally agree with the training aspect. There is no shortcut. Uh, but this is also true uh, that for the international cardiologists who are experienced enough, it's, it's not something too difficult to learn. You're already doing CTOs, you're hang handling microcatheters, uh, and you're taking out thrombus from beating heart, moving arteries, moving targets. Uh, so taking, removing the same thrombus from static no arteries. Uh, so probably that should not be very difficult provided we are willing to uh, sacrifice a bit of our time and uh, we have the motivation to deliver the service, then yes, we can learn it. Can I have my slides on, please?
So mechanical thrombectomy, uh, we've seen the eligibility criteria and all, so I'll just move on with the, okay, good, I have my slides now. So different techniques available to us, keeping it very simple. One way is you just aspirate the clot. You go in, just do the aspiration and bring the clot out. The second technique is stent retriever. So here, the difference from the coronary is that in coronary, we mostly have an underlying stenosis as well. There's a thrombus and there's a stenosis in primary PCI. So we have to remove the thrombus and we have to deliver a stent there. But in majority of the uh, stroke patients, there is no underlying uh, stenosis. We have 10 to 15 percent cases where we have an underlying stenosis as well. But in majority of the cases, it's just the thrombus that needs to come out. So the stent that we use here is not permanently deployed. This is the stent that goes in. It grabs the clot, and we bring the stent out. <coughs> so we leave nothing behind. So this is the second technique. The third technique, of course, would be if we combine the two techniques. We uh, do the aspiration, and we use the stent. So that's the third technique. So going over the first technique, this is called ADAPT which has been shown previously in the different cases. So what you see here is you have a guide catheter sitting in the internal carotid artery. So it's not common carotid. We make sure that our guide catheter sits in the internal carotid artery. Then we've got a, a, the wire, which is an O14 wire, which leads into the middle cerebral artery or wherever we need to go. It is supported by a micro catheter. And just behind that, is an aspiration catheter. So we have four things going forward. One is your guide catheter. Through that is going your aspiration catheter, which is mostly six French or five French. And then you've got a micro catheter and wire leading the way. So you just take your wire and micro catheter across the clot, and then you bring in your aspiration device. You remove the wire and the micro catheter, and you put suction on the aspiration catheter, and you pull the clot out. So this is a patient of ours with basilar uh, occlusion, and you can see that the distal tip of the basilar artery is occluded, and we know that the distal basilar tips are mostly embolic occlusions. So what I've shown in the cartoon is there's an orange clot sitting there, and the aspiration catheter goes. The moment it hugs the clot, we stop there, we start aspirating, and, and we just bring everything out. So this is exactly what was done here. So the, the, you can see an O14 wire, which had initially gone up with a micro catheter, and then the aspiration catheter has come right up to the tip of the uh, distal basilar, and then the wire and micro catheter have been removed, and suction applied to this aspiration catheter, and aspiration catheter is removed. So that's all that has been done, and the basilar artery is all open. Now, this basilar artery has a mortality of 95 to 97 percent if not intervened. These patients either will be quadriplegic or they will remain comatosed. Uh, so aspiration, it was, I think, maybe 20 minutes job, and the patient is back to normal life. So this is very effective if the clot and the catheter are coaxial to each other. But if the clot and the aspiration catheter are not coaxial to each other, and you have the scenario that is shown on the top figure, then it's not easy to aspirate this clot. So in this situation, we need to do something different. And this is where the stent retriever will be of help. So in this case, you can take a wire, take a micro catheter, just go across the clot, remove your wire, and through the same micro catheter, we push our stent retriever in and deploy it across the clot, like this. So in this case, we haven't brought any aspiration catheter up. It's just the micro catheter and the stent that has been delivered. And then we just pull it out, and it brings the clot with it. This is the second technique. And this is a case which shows the same thing. We've got a pseudo occlusion of the carotid in this case, and we've got an MCA occlusion. We did aspiration from the carotid, and we opened up the whole carotid. And then we saw that the MCA is also occluded. So you can see a wire with a loop going in front and a micro catheter behind it. And then this stent retriever is being deployed. We actually unsheath the stent. We bring it through the micro catheter, and then we just keep it there, and we pull the micro catheter back. The stent automatically gets deployed. So we unsheath the stent there. And after that, 
we just remove the stent and you can see the clot that came out with it and you can see the recanalized middle cerebral artery. So this was the second technique. But our main aim is to get Tiki 3 flow in the very first pass. So how do you make sure that you get Tiki 3 flow in the first pass and you do not get distal embolizations to new territories? So the best way of doing it is by combining the two techniques. So when you combine these two techniques, we call it a Sulambra technique. So what we do is, once we've deployed the stent retriever, instead of pulling it out, we also bring in our aspiration catheter. So the aspiration catheter comes right up to the clot, so we apply suction through it. So now we've got the clot uh, grabbed in the stent, and we're also applying suction, so we pull both the things out together, and this is called Sulambra. So this is an interesting patient, 45 years old, young lady with severe mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, came in with two hours history of stroke, left-sided hemiplegia. Interestingly, as part of the workup, we do the ECG as well, and that showed an anterior STEMI. And she also had acute limb ischemia, so she had showers of thrombus everywhere. So, you can see that there's no flow in the right femoral at all. There's no flow. You can see the sheath is blocking everything. So we took the patient to the cath lab. Whenever you have this situation, you always start off with the uh, brain first. So you can see a stent deployed here. And then we brought our, so, uh, the aspiration catheter up. You can see the aspiration catheter going up. The stent is already deployed there. And once the two are together, we simply pull both of them together out and we recanalize the artery and we quickly moved on with the primary PCI. We can see the LED blocked here and we knew that this was embolic. She's very young. We tried with the thrombuster, it did not work. We are lucky that at RIC, General Kiani purchased, uh, provided us with this EngioJet machine. So we used the EngioJet catheter to aspirate this clot because it was a big embolus which thrombuster could not and uh, you can see the final result after that. And then we had our cardiac surgeons stand by in the cath lab and right there and then they performed the Fogarty embolectomy and the acute limb ischemia was treated. So all three things could be managed in the cath lab. And occasionally, uh, Dr. Hamza has shown this technique being applied on the uh, basal artery as well. We have to apply, if the Sulambra technique fails, then we can use two parallel stents, deploy it in two branches, have the aspiration catheter behind them, and, and then pull everything out. And usually it succeeds. So this is where nothing else is working. So this is a patient of ours with a ICR terminus occlusion. And you can see on the other side, there's a stent retriever and a, and a catheter there. And we did Solumbra for this, but they did not succeed. We tried twice or thrice. And then we decided to go with the two parallel stent techniques. So we deployed one stent in the anterior cerebral artery, the other one in the middle cerebral artery. And once the two stents were deployed, then we brought our respiration catheter up. And amongst the three of them, when we pulled it out, we were able to remove that thrombus, which otherwise we were not successful in doing. Occasionally, we, so occasionally you have difficulty going from the femoral approach. You can go to brachial approach. Uh, but at times, even the brachial approach is not possible because of the carotid tortuosity, and you can't take any hardware up. So in those situations, you can do a direct carotid puncture as well. So this is a patient who was our cath, uh, father of our cath nurse, who came in with stroke. And uh, unfortunately, femoral, brachial, every approach, we could not take the hardware up. So we gave the patient general anesthesia, we put the patient on ventilator, we took a micropuncture kit, we took a roadmap, you can use the ultrasound guidance or you can use the roadmap to do the direct carotid puncture. And we did it with the micropuncture kit. And then you take a check injection to make sure that you're in the internal carotid artery, but the puncture has to be in the common carotid as low as possible. And then we took our six French sheath in and then rest of the procedure was simple. Um, we didn't have to do much over here. Uh, what is important in this is that whenever you have to do a direct carotid access, it's important that you intubate the patient now because if you cause any carotid hematoma, 
uh, intubation may become very difficult later on. So it's much safer to intubate the patient and then do the direct carotid access and do the puncture. So with that, I think I'm available for any questions that you have regarding the thrombectomy techniques. So please feel free to ask any questions. Sir. Um. So, so distal embolization is, yes, it does happen during stroke intervention as well. So the way to reduce that is we have a balloon tip guide catheter that's specifically meant for this purpose. So what you do is you, if you use the balloon tip guide catheter, you place it in the internal carotid artery. And when you are going to pull your stent retriever and the aspiration catheter out, you inflate that balloon. So you stop the forward flow and you apply aspiration on the guide catheter. So you are not only you're not only stopping the forward flow, but you're actually aspirating and reversing the flow as well. And during that, you pull your stent retriever and the catheter out, so there is no forward force that is going to cause that thrombus to embolize. So it really reduces the chances of distal embolization, but still it can happen. And if it happens, then we've got stent retrievers of smaller caliper, we've got aspiration catheters of smaller size that can go way ahead into the circulation and you can bring that cl uh, clot out as well. If you don't have those devices available, then what we do is we go ahead with the microcatheter into that circulation where that clot has dislodged and we give a small bolus dose of intraarterial TPA, alteplase, and that works on that. Uh, excuse me. <coughs> So, uh, in the interest of time, I think we'll have to skip some questions. I apologize for that. I'm going to ask, uh, invite Dr. Abdul Salam, uh, Dr. Salman Abdul Qayyum, our neurologist from uh, Rawalpindi Institute of Cardiology, to give his presentation and experience uh, of uh, setting up a stroke center in uh, a cardiac center. So, everybody asks this question about Rawalpindi Institute of Cardiology doing interventions without a neurologist. So, that's not true. We have a neurologist, we have our, he has his own team. We have our neurosurgical backup MOU signed with DHQ. We've got Dr. Lubna Miraj sitting here from Med Department of Medicine, and she's running the uh, stroke wards in our neighboring hospital, and we have a collaboration with them as well. So Salman, we've, we are running short of time, so we need to rush. Unfortunately, we are already late. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I will be no, I will I try to like quick discussion with time. Can I have my slides, please? <laughs> <laughs> हो सकता है टाइमर का इश्यू होगा चलाया होगा ना ना देखना रहा हूँ ओके बिस्मिल्लाह रखना रे सर गिवन डायरेक्शन आई एम डॉक्टर सलमान स्ट्रोक न्यूरोलॉजिस्ट एक्यूट स्ट्रोक प्रोग्राम रावल पिंडी इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ कार्डियोलॉजी आई बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ सेटिंग अप स्ट्रोक इंटरवेंशन सर्व so uh, briefly, I would like to share this study that uh, in this, it was published in 2016, that quality of life after stroke in Pakistan. And uh, I, I want to share two findings here that in this study, we've, they found that more than 54% uh, patients with stroke were living with moderate to severe disability. And secondly, uh, more than 57% caregivers left, either left their job or modified working hours due, due to giving care to the stroke patient. Uh, secondly, the data available about the disability prevalence in Pakistan is not reliable. Uh, 
uh, in contrary to the WHO data which says that 15% uh, of population may have some kind of disability but in uh, Pakistani data we can see that it was uh, in 1998 it was 2.54 and then they, in 2017 census shows that it has decreased, the disability has decreased. So this is un under reported, this is uh, not reliable. Uh, I, will, uh, what I want to share uh, the data of uh, World Stroke or Organization, what they say they, according to World Stroke, Stroke Organization la latest fact book, the incidence and prevalence of stroke has increased over the last few years. So uh, with all these problems in mind, to start this program, we had initially a visionary leadership and motivated team, uh, ongoing 24-7 primary PCI service, cath labs including biplane, CT scan and three Tesla MRI, cardiologist with training in stroke intervention and stroke neurologist. And after uh, four years almost, now the, 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 the thing which we have achieved are, we have developed emergency stroke code team. We have established official WhatsApp group uh, of RIC for conducting tele-stroke uh, codes by neurologist, radiologist and stroke interventionist. We have trained four independent stroke interventionists and training seven more. We have established stroke HDU uh, and we have trained three stroke physicians and we have established stroke clinic. And uh, we, we do repeatedly training programs for physician and nursing, uh, nurses of our hospital. Uh, this is the view of our uh, WhatsApp group which we use for the tele-stroke uh, advice about the stroke codes. Secondly, or there are certain uh, units we are, which are collaborate, collaborating with us for uh, the stroke care. Uh, important of, uh, out of these are neurosurgery unit of district headquarter, uh, head, headquarter hospital Rawalpindi for neurosurgery cover. Medical unit and medical ICU cover is given by Benazir Bhutto Hospital Rawalpindi and rehabilitation service uh, center with multidisciplinary team that is National Institute of Rehabilitation Medicine. They are supporting in us in this program. Time is brain. As we know, I will quickly go through uh, this uh, algorithm which we follow uh, in all the patients which come to RIC. And the important thing is the, the timeline. The first time target is door to CT time, which is 20 minutes. Uh, during the workup, initial workup, then CT scan is done in the ER. Then the second time target is door to needle time, that is 60 minutes for the cases which are selected for thrombolysis. And during this time, CT angiogram is done. Uh, for evaluation of large vessel occlusion and after that the third time target is door to groin puncture time that is 90 minutes uh, for the uh, cases which are large vessel occlusion which have large, ve large vessel occlusion and they are candidates for thrombectomy uh, and the criteria we are following we are uh, American Heart Association and uh, European Stroke Organization guidelines we are strictly following them to screen the patient and select the patient for the intervention so we uh, do audit all these timings daily and uh, this is a view of our daily audit report which in which we discuss our uh, problems and then we try to improve them now finally I will I want to share the data of, of uh, which we have collected and uh, we, what we have done in the last four years the first stroke intervention was done in on 13th April 2018 and up till now we have coded more than 5,000 patients in RIC and uh, this is the yearly distribution. Initially uh, 2019 and 20 we the service for, for 6 hours and in 2021 it was extended to 24-7 service and you can see the increase in the number of the patients which are coming to RIC with suspected uh, stroke with the symptoms of the stroke. Out of these 5,000 5, patients, 14% patients have hemorrhagic stroke and they are referred to neurosurgery unit. 13% have stroke mimic and they are referred to medical unit for further care. And 73% have ischemic strokes. They are further evaluated, which includes CT angiogram. Ischemic strokes, uh, uh, the, the, the patient with ischemic stroke out of these, 16% had minor strokes and after initial evaluation they are referred to OPD uh, clinic, uh, stroke clinic and are ma ma man managed there for secondary prevention of the stroke and uh, the rehab, uh, related rehab. 8% uh, patient out of this group qualified for stroke intervention and uh, their intervention were done in uh, RIC and 76% patient of ischemic stroke they presented late 
out of these some could be uh, candidate for uh, the stroke intervention but uh, due to uh, lack of awareness they presented late to the hospital up till now we have done more than 302 cases La last night one case was added into that and uh, i for acute, acute stroke interventions were done in 302 cases IV TPA alone was given in 114 patient means these were small vessel occlusions and they were candidates for thrombolysis and mechanical thrombectomy was done in 188 patients. They said there is further breakdown of these mechanical thrombectomy. Uh, in 142 cases only mechanical thrombectomy was done and in 46 cases initially IV TPA was given and then uh, mechanical thrombectomy was done and mechanical thermectomy success rate was that more in more than 70 percent cases TIKI 3 score was achieved. Distribution of vascular occlusion 64 percent patient had middle cerebral artery occlusion 22 percent had tandem occlusions in, in uh, mostly with ICA uh, involvement and uh, 14 percent has basal artery occlusion. Now the outcome. Regarding the outcome, uh, we can compare the outcome with uh, the, the randomized endovascular trials which show that functional independence uh, at 90 days is between 33 percent to 70, 71 percent which depends upon the selection criteria of that trial. And I want to share here another study that stroke patients treated, that it was published in 2022, treated by thrombectomy in real life differ from cohorts of the clinical trial. Uh, it was a prospective observational study and they found that independent outcome that was MRS of 0 to 2 was achieved in 26% uh, cases only. So in our data, the good outcome, the recovery, uh, which is written recovery here, uh, is, was in 42% patient with 26% patient with 0 to 1 MRS within 90 days and 16% uh, patient with uh, MRS of 2 to 3. Uh, 2% patient with the, which, who received uh, IV TPA had uh, symptomatic intracranial bleed and again 2% patient who uh, uh, undergone this procedure a mechanical thrombectomy had symptomatic intracranial bleed which includes reperfusion hemorrhage. <clears throat> we will keep the service up. Stroke intervention is a ray of hope in reducing post-stroke disability in our region. Our stroke registry data will help in discovering status of stroke affected population. Nationally speaking, more centers should step forward and develop stroke pro programs to benefit uh, local patients. Our plans under progress making RIC a state of the art acute stroke intervention and training center. Uh, we are getting ultra fast whole brain CT perfusion scanner with art artificial intelligence image analysis software to improve our patient selection for, uh, for the intervention. And training programs for other centers which are in process of developing uh, stroke program. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Salman, for staying on time. So if you, yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, in the meantime, I'll just invite our last speaker, Dr. Abdul Salam from uh, Taba Heart Institute to give his presentation. Sir, please. TPA only. The patients where you gave just uh, TPA, intravenous TPA. What was the result? Recovery? Sir, so there was a further of breakdown of this. Uh, it, the, the results with IVT were comparable to the studies. Like for more than 40% uh, had MRS 0 to 1 within uh, 90 days. So they were comparable to the other international studies. Assalamu alaikum everybody, I'm Dr. Abdul Salam, an interventional fellow from Tabba Heart Institute. And I'll be presenting uh, my case, uh, which is a case of mechanical thrombectomy of acute MCA occlusion. This is just a random uh, case of uh, what we have done over the last two years. So I'll start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
So my case is of a 72 years gentleman who is known case of diabetes and hypertension, CKD with baseline creatinine of two chain smoker and COPD. He had cabbage in 2008 and PCI in 2019 to the venous graft and his recent EF was 45 percent. Presented to our ER with episode of dizziness and vertigo and he had just before he come to the ER chest discomfort associated with mild shortness of breath. So he was tachycardic and the ECG has shown atrial fibrillation with RVR which was being diagnosed for the first time as we have his previous record and it has shown always a sinus rhythm. So on the further workup his troponin was elevated and he was admitted in the hospital for further management. So the next morning and in the cardiology step down unit only the patient has complained of shortness of breath and when the team came to assess him and examine him they have noticed that he was not following commands, he was not moving the left side, uh, uh, the left, uh, side limbs, he had no verbal response and he was localizing pain only and that's too from the left upper limb. So his blood pressure was elevated, his heart rate was controlled and his oxygen saturation was normal in the room air and on the neurological examination the right upper and lower limb had power of 1 by 5 only. His blood sugar was not low, it was 200 milligram per deciliter so the team immediately have stopped his heparin infusion and our, our stroke intervention team, including the neurologist, the radiologist, and the inter interventional cardiology team, all were involved and brought on board. So his NIH SSS was calculated and came to be 26, considering that his uh, pre-modified ranking score was 1. So he was shifted to the radiology department for an emergent CT scan. So if we see the CT scan on the right hemisphere, it might not be clear over here, but there was a diffuse hypo. Uh, hypodensity at the MCA territory and there is loss of the differentiation between the white and the gray matter which is suggestive of an acute infarction of the middle cerebral artery. So subsequently immediately a CT angio was done and we can see a thing over here in the view that the, uh, the first part of the um, uh, MCA which is M1 is intact showing normal opacification with the contrast and once we go to the M2 so there is uh, an occlusion and there is a complete cut off over here we see the same finding on the axial view so the M1 is fine once it comes to M2 there is a complete cut off and this arterial tree which we see in the middle showing the same finding. So we have shifted the patient directly to the cath lab and on the cath lab table and under ultrasound guidance and access to the right femoral artery was taken and an 8 French sheath was placed and we see the angiogram of the femoral artery and this we do free, um, uh, routinely in, the, uh, in our cath lab. So we started from the right cerebral circulation which has shown no abnormalities and the left carotid artery we have seen over here that it has shown no uh, obstructive disease. This all we have seen already on the CTA. So coming to the uh, cerebral angiogram of the left side, so as we see M1 is fine at the level of M2, slightly distally there is a complete cutoff and this finding is consistent which we, uh, on what we have seen on the CTA. So just to mention that the access to the left internal carotid artery was obtained with the, initially with JR46 French, which was subsequently exchanged on an amplatzer super stiff wire with a cello guide catheter 8 French which has a balloon tip. Okay, so inside the cello we have taken the uh, Navian support catheter that was our intermediate catheter and it was advanced up to level of the M1 and the lesion of the M2 was uh, crossed with the uh, Sion catheter uh, after taking a micro catheter which was a rebar micro catheter. So then the uh, wire was taken back and through the micro catheter we have taken a solitaire to a stent river through the micro catheter all the way to the M2 and it was deployed over there at the site of the occlusion. Then the micro catheter was removed and we have the stent over there. And as per protocol, so the proximal port of the, both the cello catheter and the intermediate catheter were attached to 50 cc syringe and continuous negative pressure and suction was done for a total of five minutes. So after five minutes, the whole assembly of the stent and the intermediate catheter were removed back in the uh, guiding catheter and they were talking out and we have succeeded to retrieve a large thrombus which came out with the stent. So after making sure that we have a bled back sufficiently from the uh, uh, guiding catheter, we have repeated the cerebral angiogram of the 
left uh, cerebral circulation. And as you see over here, by the grace of Allah, we have achieved uh, a complete restoration of the blood flow in the whole MCA and its branches. We deflated the tip uh, uh, balloon of the guiding catheter and the catheter was taken out. We have removed the eight French sheath. And in this case particularly, we have closed the artery with Broglite per close, but this is something we don't do uh, routinely and we have called it a successful stroke intervention. With this, I thank you very much for your attention and the cases for the panel for discussion. Thank you. So thank you very much. And with that, we come to the end of this session. I thank all the panelists and would request the next panelist to come up on the stage for the next session. And General Ashur, sir, just to, in one minute, I'll, I'll, I'll reply to your uh, question. So we all know that with TPA, TPA effectiveness is mainly for the small vessels. It's not for the large vessels. So if you have an internal carotid artery occluded and you give TPA, the effectiveness is only 2 to 4 percent. But as you go distal and into the very smaller branches, that's where the TPA is actually very effective. So if you have a large vessel occlusion uh, and the patient qualifies for mechanical thrombectomy there and for TPA as well, then you need to give TPA and do the mechanical thrombectomy as well. You combine the two. But for large vessel occlusion, if you give TPA alone, effectiveness is 2 to 4% for a carotid occlusion. Thank you very much.